down. Ceremonial. And eat. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the playing of the United States National Anthem and Invocation offered by Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel William H. Horton.
the reviewing stand. Taking the reviewing stand is today's special guest, United States Air Force Colonel Retired Mike Brazelton, accompanied by the host, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, the 35th Deputy Secretary of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel William Horton. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious, loving God, we turn to you on this day to recall and honor our celebrated and at times forgotten heroes, the courageous men and the women who've fallen or been lost in combat defending our nation's belief in the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We honor and pray for our prisoners of war, for they've experienced the horror, the devastation, the pain, and the agony of captivity. We also stand in solidarity with those who wait, not ever really knowing the fate of their loved ones. Thank you for the many organizations and the people who continue the efforts to account for all of our missing service members and civilians. We also pray for those who continue to face armed conflict today that they would also know the hope and the honor of serving our nation's true colors. May our nation never forget the selfless service, dedication to duty, and the loyalty our service, of our service members, civilians, and their families. May we never allow the sacrifices of those who've gone before us to be forgotten or lost in time. Unite us in our gratitude for your many blessings and in our mission to proclaim freedom and for the captives and for the release from the darkness for those in prison. In your precious and holy name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks. Good 
morning to everyone. It's my honor to observe this important occasion with each of you who's joined us here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging our distinguished guests and members of the International Diplomatic Corps who are in the audience with us. This includes the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Mark Knapper, who is just back from Hanoi, where he helped shepherd an historic visit by uh, President Biden. For the past 50 years, the United States and Vietnam have worked together to account for Americans missing from the Vietnam War, beginning with the return of 591 prisoners of war. Without the mutual cooperation between our two nations, we would not be able to support the robust and sustained operations to recover U.S. personnel, operations that have helped return 733 U.S. service members and civilians home to their families. Today, the Department's commitment to the fullest possible accounting of our missing personnel extends back to World War II. Since the end of the Vietnam War, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency and its predecessors have managed the recovery, identification, and return of thousands of our missing personnel to their families who have long sought answers. Sustaining these operations is no small task. It takes cooperation on a global scale, and we are grateful for the 45 nations who partner with us on this mission to search for and recover our missing from theaters around the world. That's why we're so fortunate to be joined today by ambassadors and defense attaches from nations who collaborate on these efforts. This effort also includes supportive private individuals and groups, and I want to acknowledge all of you here today who are representing those. Folks like retired Marine Corps Sergeant Major Justin Luhu, an Iraq War veteran and Navy Cross recipient who last year completed a 3,365 mile walk from Boston, Massachusetts to Newport, Oregon to raise awareness about DPAA's mission. And just today, this morning, he completed a 270-mile march from Bedford, Virginia, right here to this parade field. So thank you to Sergeant Major Lou Hu for your efforts to help find your comrades in arms. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to recognize the families of the missing. We know that enduring the grief and uncertainty throughout the years is difficult. Please know that your missing family members are not forgotten. The DPAA works tirelessly to find answers for you year in and year out. And each year, we gather on this National POW MIA Recognition Day to assure you that we remember them and that we will not give up on our mission to account for them. So thank you for being here and for keeping the faith. Already this year, DPAA, DPAA has accounted for 123 missing personnel, members like Army Air Corps 2nd Lieutenant Fred Brewer of North Carolina. During World War II, Lieutenant Brewer was part of the esteemed African-American fighter pilot unit known as the Tuskegee Airmen. More than seven decades ago, Brewer departed Ramatali Air Base in Italy to escort bombers to their targets in Germany. On the way, his bomber group encountered heavy clouds. Lieutenant Brewer attempted to a steep rise above them, but his engine stalled, causing his plane to crash. Until last month, he was one of the 26 Tuskegee Airmen whose whereabouts were unknown. A rosette will now be placed next to his name on the tablets of the missing at the Florence American Cemetery to indicate that he has been accounted for. Today, we are honored to have his cousin, Brenda Brewer, in the audience. Thank you for being here, Brenda. Can you stand, Brenda, if you're here? Thank you, Brenda, for being here. I hope that Lieutenant Brewer's recovery has brought some measure of peace to you and your family. Our success in, account in our accounting missions would not be possible, as I said, without our partners across the globe. In April 2021, the Republic of Korea's Ministry for Finding Miss Missing Personnel came across remains near the hill where Americans went missing dur during a battle in April 1951. The remains were carefully exhumed and sent to a lab for testing. In the following October, the ministry turned over those remains to DPAA. 
after DPAA sent the remains to its own lab for analysis, it was able to identify U.S. Army Sergeant Stanley Turba. Soon, his daughter Sandra will welcome him home, more than 72 years after he went missing in the Korean War. And finally this year, the Vietnam Office for Seeking Missing Persons celebrated its 50th anniversary, and I'd like to recognize it for its long-standing mutual cooperation. During the height of COVID-19, when restrictions prevented our DPAA team from traveling to Vietnam, its teams, trained by DPAA, traveled to multiple sites looking for the remains of American personnel. In March 2021, the team visited a crash site of a 1969 F-4, a two-seater aircraft, in Quang Nam Province. There, they, they recovered the remains of two Americans, those of U.S. Air Force Colonel Ernest DeSoto and Captain Frederick Hall. Colonel DeSoto was given a dignified burial in June, and Captain Hall will finally be laid to rest next month on October 10th. These are several of the many stories of those recovered and returned to their families, stories of sacrifice, hope, and resolve. For you families of the missing, Please know your strength motivates us each day as we do this work and follow through on our solemn and unwavering commitment to achieve the fullest accounting possible of our missing personnel. Thank you. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce our next speaker. Colonel Michael Brazelton is a retired Air Force pilot and a four-time Silver Star recipient who was held captive for more than six years in a Vietnamese prison. I'll let him tell his harrowing story, but I will say this. Colonel Brazelton, your incredible courage, fortitude, and patriotism is an inspiration to us all. It's an honor to have you, your wife Gloria, and your oldest daughter, Army Lieutenant Colonel Adriana Brazelton, with us today. Please join me in giving Colonel Brazelton a warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to POW MIA Recognition Day event once again. I am honored to be here. I would like to acknowledge all the dignitaries that are here, but that would take most of my time. From the list of attendees, uh, it seems uh, just about everybody here is a distinguished guest and devoted to our common cause. The first day after I was shot down and captured, I was sent to a prison called the Zoo on the outskirts of Hanoi. I was put in isolation in a building we called the office. Until you get used to being solo, confinement is a de devastating, uh, uh, devastating for the mind. However, within a day or so, I realized there were other Americans in the office with me. By counting dishes, I surmised that there were six of us there. I had a compulsion to contact them probably because I was anxious for companionship and I didn't want to be so alone. I shared a wall with one cell and I tapped to the wall to get the prisoner's attention. Over time, I learned his name. I tapped to another cell that was catty corner to me and got the name of another POW. A few weeks later, a new American pilot was added. I contacted him by talking under the door. Five months later, I was given a roommate and moved into a building we called the pool hall. It had 20 two-man cells in it. The two, PA, two POWs on the other side of our back wall were old timers who had been POWs for a year and a half. By tapping, they filled us in on the rules of engagement set up by senior POWs before they were removed from the general population. The major directive, of course, was to follow the code of conduct. But the second was to collect names. 
For us, it was vitally important to learn the names of every POW who was in the system and know where they were located. If, if anything were to happen to me, there would be people who knew I was a POW and would probably know how I perished. As it turned out, Seaman Doug Hegdell, a few years later, an early releasee, had memorized more than 250 POW names and repeated them to the authorities back home and to the families. It was the first news my parents and sisters had that confirmed that I was alive. Whenever the Vietnamese authorities moved us around, which wasn't often, our primary job was to figure out where everybody was, determine if anybody was missing, perhaps taken to another camp, and, we sh and identify any new prisoners in the camp. We did this by tapping, by note drops, by flashing from building to building, and the use of a hand code. In addition to just learning the names, we could keep track of POW's health, pass on information learned in interrogations, disperse guidance received from senior ranking officers in dealing with the prison officials and guards, and get information from home that might not be available to POWs in general. In one example, the pilot who was responsible for sending my belongings home after I was shot down and writing letters to my family was himself shot down and captured several weeks after I was. Eventually, and I mean eventually, a couple years later, he filled me on the letters he had received from my parents and friends. Basically, we were accounting for our friends, which is essentially what DPAA is doing on a much grander scale. Along with uh, its counterparts in other countries and in unison with the League of Families, we want an accounting of those soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and civilians, our friends who did not come home. In some cases, the remains can be recovered, which provides a great deal of closure to the families. In the saddest of these cases, there are no remains to be found. For the past 35 years, the United States and Vietnam, two nations that were once adversaries, have worked together to account for the missing of both nations. It is this cooperation that has drawn nations, our nations closer together and helped heal the legacies of war. The parents for the unaccounted for have, for the most part, passed on. Their brothers and sisters are my age, in their 70s and 80s. Their children are in their 50s and 60s. But still, at the very least, they want to know what happened to their loved one. I cannot think of a more noble mission to determine what happened to our missing compatriots than to bring their remains home if possible, or to provide information on when, where, and how unrecoverable friends met their fate. A few weeks ago, uh, close to last Memorial Day, Gloria and I were attending a music salon at the home of a good friend of ours. At the beginning of the program, he made a few remarks about the significance of the day. He also mentioned to a gathering of about 50 people that I had been a POW for almost seven years. To my surprise and embarrassment, everybody stood and applauded. I turned to the lady next to me, a stranger, and said, I can't believe that the POWs are still regarded so highly more than 50 years after the war. The lady turned to me and said, some things should never be forgotten. Likewise, our friends from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Mideast, who did not come home, should never be forgotten by their countrymen and women. We should always work to the fullest possible accounting of our missing. The observance of National POW MIA Recognition Day and the mission of uh, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency shows that they have not been forgotten. Thank you.
Lockwood All Families representing prisoners of war and those still missing in action, please stand to be honored.
this time, please stand as the United States Army Band plays the Joint Service Medley. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention skyward for a flyover honoring America's prisoners of war and missing in action.
ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Department of Defense 2023 National POW MIA Recognition Day Ceremony. Thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.